Fidel Castro, lawyer, revolutionary, brilliant military strategist, and one of the most controversial leaders of all time. He stood for his beliefs, even if it meant staging an armed revolution, bringing the world the closest it has ever been to a thermonuclear war. Fidel Castro led a revolution to liberate the people of Cuba, and held the head office of the country for 49 years. During this time, he played a major role in the Cold War, and brought the world the closest it has ever been to a thermonuclear war, and changed U.S. and Cuban relations forever. When Castro resigned from his presidency in 2008, he left a legacy of revolution and of how a tiny island in the Gulf of Mexico defied the most powerful nation in the Western Hemisphere under the leadership of one man, Fidel Castro. Fidel's father was a sugarcane farmer and sent Fidel to boarding schools all through his youth. He was both intellectually and athletically gifted and soon gained the respect of his peers. Castro enrolled in law school at the University of Havana and became increasingly passionate about social justice during this time. By the time he graduated in 1950 and had participated in two foreign political uprisings, became the president of the Law Students Federation at the University of Havana, and joined an anti-communist political party to reform government corruption in Cuba. In 1952, Fulgencio Batista seized power of Cuba and set himself up as dictator, canceled the upcoming elections, and solidified his power with the military and the wealthy. Fidel Castro, who was expecting to win political office in the 1952 elections, gathered a group of rebels who also opposed the Batista regime, and on July 26, 1953, with 150 rebels, he led an attack on the Moncada military barracks, hoping that he could acquire enough weapons to create an armed uprising. Tax started at dawn and was quickly brought to an end with many of Castro's men dead and dozens of others captured, including Castro himself. At Fidel's trial, he utters the phrase, history will absolve me, which will define him for the rest of his life. Castro is sentenced to 15 years in prison, but is released after two years as Batista buckles under foreign pressure and lets all political prisoners go. Shortly after his release, Fidel travels to Mexico and there meets Che Guevara, who will help Castro throughout his 26th of July movement, the name given to Castro's revolution after the day of the Moncado assault. In December 1956, Castro came back to Cuba on a boat with 80 other Cuban revolutionaries, and when they landed in a town near Manzanillo, they were intercepted by Batista's army and most were killed. Fidel, his brother Raul, and Guevara made it to the Sierra Maestra Mountains where Batista thought they would not be able to survive. Over the next two years, Castro and his revolutionaries waged a guerrilla war against Batista. Starting in 1958, Castro had multiple large-scale military victories, taking control of many key areas as Batista's public support started to fall out from under him. The U.S., who was originally funding the Batista regime, had dropped their backing and didn't support either side in their efforts to control Cuba. After two years of intense guerrilla warfare, the 26th of July movement led by Fidel Castro invaded the capital of Cuba. Soon after the assault, it is announced that Batista has fled the country. The people of Cuba admire Castro for taking power not by coup, but by popular revolution. Castro is embraced with a massive crowd at every town he passes through on his three-day march to Havana, all of them overjoyed to be liberated from Batista's strong-armed rule. Fidel Castro it becomes the new Prime Minister of Cuba, and his first order is to put hundreds of Batista's loyalists on trial. Over 500 of them are sentenced to death by firing squad. A majority of the population of Cuba supported the killings, with one million of them showing up to Castro's speech defending his actions. Fidel wanted to reduce the United States' economic dominance on the island, so he nationalized all factories and plantations. Castro visited the United States as a guest of the National Press Club to try to keep peace with America, but President Eisenhower refused to meet with him. He was embraced by the American public, but the government saw signs of communism and kept him under a watchful eye. When Batista fled, he looted Cuba's treasury, and soon Castro found himself with no money to run the government. He asked the U.S. for help, to which they refused. Fidel then turned to the Soviet Union for economical aid. They soon struck up a deal. Castro would give sugar and other crops to the Soviets in return for machinery and other needed equipment, further stoking the fires of the Cold War. After this agreement, President Eisenhower bans all sugar imports from Cuba. Castro, in retaliation, seizes all American companies in Cuba. This worsens the hard feelings between Cuba and the U.S.
A trade embargo was enacted by the United States after months of Castro seizing American companies. Under President Kennedy, the U.S. begins looking for ways to remove Castro from power. Kennedy has 1,400 Cuban exiles trained by U.S. military advisors. Their goal is to invade Cuba in a small cove called the Bay of Pigs and overthrow Castro with the public support. The attack is a failure. Within 72 hours, all the rebels are either captured or killed, receiving no help from the people of Cuba. Many Cubans believe that Castro's revolution was wrong from the start, but they are too afraid of imprisonment or execution to speak out. Many of these people make the 90-mile trip to Miami, Florida. It's from these immigrants that the U.S. learns that Castro has made a deal with the Soviet Union's Nikita Khrushchev, not only for economic aid, but also for weapons. The missiles on Cuba would allow the Soviets to enact a nuclear strike on any country in the Western Hemisphere. The U.S. enacts a naval blockade of Cuba in retaliation. President Kennedy and Chairman Khrushchev send each other a series of messages, each demanding the other back down. Eventually, Kennedy agrees not to invade Cuba and to take nuclear missiles out of Turkey if the missiles are removed from Cuba. These negotiations are completed without ever consulting Castro, infuriating him. Twelve years after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, things in Cuba haven't changed. There is an increasing reliance on the Soviet Union for all things economic. Castro believes that the CIA has been attempting to assassinate him. At least eight CIA assassination attempts are confirmed. Two of Castro's goals when he rose to power were to improve the healthcare and education systems of Cuba, and he did just that. He created over 10,000 new classrooms and made all healthcare for Cubans entirely free, with very good quality care at the same time. Castro began to export doctors and soldiers to various places in revolution, proving to many countries that he is still a world leader. In 1980, the economic conditions of Cuba began to go downhill, and Castro, as a way of relieving political unrest, allowed all Cubans who wanted to leave to do just that. After one year when Castro closes the immigration, over 125,000 immigrants have come to Florida, causing a political nightmare in the U.S. Although the U.S. trade embargo has been hard for Castro to deal with economically, he believes that it has helped the nation become more self-reliant. This all goes downhill with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Most of Cuba's money came from trade and aid from the Soviets, and now without that influx of cash, there are food shortages and many Cubans risk their lives from refs to travel to the United the US States. US is pressuring Castro to embrace democracy, but Castro is unwilling to give up his dictatorship, so there's no softening in US-Cuban relations. In 1996, Cuba shoots down two civilian planes whose pilots were in an organization helping Cubans fleeing by boat. This forces the U.S. to increase sanctions on Cuba, allowing the U.S. to halt any trade with any non-U.S. company doing business with Castro, hoping that Castro will give in to democracy in order to restore connections with the U.S. Fidel believes that restoring relations with the U.S. would cause another time of disaster. He's worried that Cuba would not be able to cope with the hundreds of thousands of Americans that would be flowing in. In July 2006, Castro has surgery for intestinal bleeding. During his recovery, he hands off leadership to his brother, Raul. In 2008, Fidel's health starts to disintegrate and he resigns from his presidency and gives power to his brother, Raul. The U.S. hoped that Raul might make the transfer to democracy, but he wants to keep Castro's legacy alive. In his words, this revolution has gone on for 50 years and will continue for 50 more. That may have been the case in 2008, but relations between the U.S. and Cuba have recently become more solidified. On December 17, 2014, Raul and President Obama restored diplomatic ties between the two nations, but the trade embargo is unlikely to be lifted anytime soon. To the supporters of the Castro Revolution, the fight against Batista and the Sierra Maestros is a stuff of legend. This legacy continues to carry on. Even though he is no longer in a leading position, his name still makes the news, telling of stories of his leadership from the 50s and 60s, and of how his legacy still lives on.